this is where we stopped last time. This is where we stopped in terms of the 7.3 material. We did this particular problem. And I mentioned to you guys, if you read this problem, you can see that they don't give us the sample mean. They don't give us the sample standard deviation or population standard deviation. And the only thing they give us is they give us the sample and within those sample, how many people qualify for this description that they give us, right? Or the category that they give us. So we did this item and, and they asked us to find a point estimator and I mentioned to you guys, the point estimator is basically you take the X, the X divided by, you take the X divided by the, the N, right? So if you look at this particular problem, uh, before we can do any of this item, you need to identify what they've given you, right? So in this case, they, you know that they give us the N, which is 500. The X, which is 162, or call it graduate. And then we know, or this is what we did last time, is we know that because they asked us to construct the confident interval, our calculator can help us to calculate this item, which we using the one proportional Z interval. We're not using the T, we're not using the Z, we're using the one proportional. And to do that reminder, you go to, um, um, so you look at part A, they ask you to find the point estimator for this proportion. And I mentioned that if you want to, yes, you can go ahead and take the 162 divided by the 500 to give you 3.324. Uh, if not, you can do part B and your calculator does give you the point estimator too. If you go to scroll down, you hit stat, you scroll over to test just like before, and you go down to the one proposal. Again, this is the three option, right? The Z interval, the T interval, and the one proportional Z interval. And if we choose the Z proportional Z interval, they ask us to type in the X, which in this case, 162. They ask us to type in the N, 500, and the confident interval is 98% or 0.98. And if you look at this item, I mentioned earlier that right here, this is your point estimator, ladies and gentlemen, your point estimator is P hat, and the P hat is 0.324, and that is the same as you take the X divided by the N, okay, which is the average that we have. So once we have this thing here, you can see that our interval is 0.275 and 0.372. So we did this last time and I mentioned that this is your confident interval uh, and that's your calculator can illustrate or can do um, this calculation for you. You don't have to do that formula, min take the margin of error minus the, uh, or the point estimator minus the margin of error and, and so on and so forth. So once we have this thing here, um, now this is what they ask you is, Based on this information, do you believe that the, the percentage of the woman work from home is a college graduate? Uh, the man is greater than that, right? Uh, we can see that the man is 43, 43% of the men work from home or college graduate. And the interval that we, we guesstimate for the woman is only 27% to 37%. So as you're looking at this thing here, um, no, right? The men have 45%, which is not between the interval that we estimate for the woman, right? The 43% is greater than the 37%. So in this case, the percent does not follow, uh, fall under the assumption that we have or the guesstimate that we have. So in this case, it's not, okay? So looking at this item, let's take a look at this problem here. Similarly, Similarly, let's take a look at this particular problem. They ask us or they give us this information. They give us that the internet provider, um, internet service provider sample 540 customer and found that 75 of them experienced an interruption of high speed service during the previous month. So again, let's say previous month, we have a lot of hurricane and they have this item here. So they ask you to find a point estimator for the population proportion. 
And to find this point estimator, just like before, we need to know what our n is in terms of the total sample, 540. We need to know our x, and with this two number, we can find the point estimator, which is the 75 divided by the four, uh, the 540. And then for part B, we know that we can use in this stat we go to test and we use the one proportional Z because they ask us to construct a proportion, right? So again, because it's a proportion, we will use a one proportion Z. So in this case or in this problem, if you use in this feature or to locate this feature, once again, to locate this feature, you hit stat, you scroll over to test and you scroll down to the one proportional Z, one prop Z. And again, one prop Z asks you for the X for my problem, 75. They ask us for the N, 540. And they ask us for the confidence interval in this case is 90%. So this is what we have, our information or the item that we need to extract out to use in our calculator feature. So once you have this thing here, as you can see, the P hat, which is your point estimator is 0.1388889 or 1.39. It's the same as 75. If you look at this thing here, it's the same as 75 divided by 540. And again, my interval is 0.114 and 0.163. So if you take that, as you can see, those are the same. So in this case, hopefully you guys see, hopefully you guys see that it's easy to find the point estimator. And because your calculator, your feature, give it to you guys. And it's easy to find the proportion or the interval for this proportion in terms of the one proportional Z, okay? So looking at this item, uh, question, question of A or B. For part A, how do you know to use um, 90%? Well, it, it doesn't matter. Part A is basically you take 75 divided by 54 for 540. So okay. uh, if, if, uh, part A, if you look at my calculator, I told you that again, uh, part two or uh, part B can answer you, part A for you. But if you look at this thing here, you just take 75, which is your divided by 540, you will get that same number. doesn't matter. The thing is, doesn't matter what percentage you use. doesn't matter what percentage you use. Your, your point estimator is the same. If, if you look at this thing here, and if I change, if I change this instead of 90%, I change this to 0.98%, you will see that the point estimator is the same. Uh, the point estimator is just basically X divided by N, 75 divided by 540. That's what part A is. Um, so again, the, the percentage does not dictate the point estimator. So it doesn't matter what the percentage they ask you to construct, uh, you will get the same point estimator. Okay. Got it, thank you. Um, and again, uh, I just do part B so that I can answer part A. Uh, that's, you know, it's, it's there. But in short, it's just X divided by N. So for C, probably this is where a lot of you guys have problem is how do you interpret what you calculate, right? So they ask you, or this is what they tell you that the manager, the manager claimed that no more than 10% of the customer experiment this interruption in the previous month. Does the confident interval contradict this claim? So you can see that what is our guesstimate? Our guesstimate is between 11% to 16% of the customer experiment this large of, of, of interruption, right? But the manager come out say, there's no more than 10%, meaning again, it's 10% or less, right? No more than 10%. He come out and say, based on our data, based on what he have, there is no more than 10% of the customer have an interruption. And as you can see, 10% is less than what we ex estimate right? It might be true, right? Might be true based on his information, but based on our information, based on the information we got, we say that between 11% and 
right? Between 11.4 to be exact and 16.3 to be exact, but roughly between 11% and 16% of the customer have the interruption. And here he say it's only 10% or less. You can see that based on our information is contradict his claim. His claim is 10% or less, but what we found is we found out that the average percent of the customer get interruption is between 11% to be and 15% and to be short, uh, which is contradict what he tried to do, right? So again, in, in the center of this thing here, that's what our goal is, right? Our goal is if we gather the data, we can, you know, and, and in chapter eight, to be, to be exact, in chapter eight, that's what we do is we try to uh, make this claim or try to disprove this claim. And, and one way for now, the easiest way is if we know the confident interval and the claim is not under the confident interval that we have, we say that 90%, uh, you know, might be if, if we increase the, the interval, if we increase the 90, if we increase the 90, um, 98% confident interval, then we will see that it will be under that percentage. Okay. But again, in, in this case, this is what we want to do is we want to, you know, have that interval and then try to interpret the data. So once we have construct the confident interval, the next thing or the last thing in 7.3 they ask you to do is they change in the script from, from find the confident interval to find the sample size. So how large does the sample size need to be so that we can find this within this margin of error? Right. So to be in short, this is the, the margin of error formula. The margin of error formula is this. And if we do the reverse operation, if we do our algebraic reverse operation, you will see that the N is equal to this item, which is the P hat times the one minus P hat multiplied to a square root of uh, the square of the Z critical value divide by the margin of error. So in order for you to find the N, in order for you to find the N, this is what you need is you need the P hat. You need a critical value, which in this case, when we do with a proportion, we go back to a Z critical value, which is the bottom of the T distribution table. And then we need the margin of error. And if you have this, all you need to do is plug it in to this item. And reminder, because we're looking for the sample size, because we look for the N, which is the discrete data, your item will always be a whole number. So if it's decimal, we go up to the next whole number, okay? So the other item that we have, the other item that we have is if we don't present a P hat, if they don't give us the P hat, if they don't give us the point estimator, the average, the mean, uh, then we will use in this item here, we will assume that the P hat is 0.5, meaning 50% and 50%, right? 50% agree, 50% disagree. Uh, so in the case of that, if we don't have a P hat, we will use, let's say fixed number, instead of take P hat multiplied to one minus P hat, we will use this fixed number 0.25. And again, the reason why we have 0.25 is basically 0 0.5 times 0 0.5. 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, that's your 0.25. So just to be in short, if we don't have the P hat, if they don't give us the P hat, we will use this fixed number 0.25, okay? If they give us the P hat, we just plug into this formula. So everything the same is just that instead of plug in the, the P hat, we plug in 0.25. So if you look at this item here, Let's take a look at this particular example and how do we perform this item? How is the economy? A poster want to construct a 95% confident interval for a proportion of an adult who believe that the economic condition is getting better. So a Gallup poll, a Gallup poll estimate that the proportion to be a proportion to be 34%. So if you remember in chapter in chapter one, remember in a survey, in a poll, in in a survey, in a poll, the number is your sample, sample number, right? So this is what they tell you is in this poll, somebody run a poll 
and they found out that the proportion of, based on the poll that they asked, the proportion of people who believe that the economy is getting better is 34% or 0.34. And that, that, ladies and gentlemen, is your P hat because that is the proportion, that is the P hat, and that's the sample proportion because it's related to the poll. So they actually you using this estimate, what sample size need to conduct, need to have, so that we have a margin of error of 0.03. So as you can see, we have everything that we needed, right? We have everything that we needed so that we can find this N. We need the P hat, they give us the P hat, which 0.34. We need an M, they give us the M 0.03. Now, with this formula here, what are we missing? Well, the formula here, we got the P hat, we have the M. The only thing we're missing is we missing the, the Z critical value. So reminder, the Z critical value in terms of this thing here, what do, we, what do they ask us to do? Well, they ask us for a 95% confident interval. 95%, hopefully by now you know that the Z critical value for 95% is 1.96. If not, this is what we have, right? The Z critical value is right here. We have 95% and the Z, the Z value is 1.96. So we got everything we needed, ladies and gentlemen. We got the 0.34, which is the P hat. The 1.34, which is the P hat. The 1.96 is the critical value, which is your Z alpha over two. The 0.03 is your M. So if I plug it in and I multiply this item here, if I multiply this item, this is what I have. This we got this number for me for now. This we got this 2.0. I think I copy and paste and I, I, I have the wrong number there. But again, if I plug it in 0.196 divided by 0.03 will give me 65.333. And if I square them up, if I square them up, I will have 4,268.4444. And if I take 0.4 times one minus 0.4, I have 0.224. Again, 0.4 times one, one minus 0.4 will give me 0.224. And if I multiply this together, I have 957.838. And reminder, because it's a decimal, we round up to the next whole number. So if we round up to the next whole number, you will get 958. We need at least 958 people to be confident, to be able to construct a 95% confident, okay? So looking at this thing here, Hopefully you guys see that to find the sample size based on a proportion, this is our formula. If you remember in the previous 7.1, to find the sample size in 7.1, you need to take a, a, um, a critical value times the standard error divided by the margin of error, and then whatever that result is, you square them up. Right, you have that standard error times the critical value divided by the M in 7.1. In this one here, we have a P hat because we deal with a proportion, okay? And for B, if you look at this item here, they say estimate a sample size needed if there is no estimator for the P. Meaning if we don't have this poll, let's say if, if we go in, we just have this data, we just have this data, we want to know we want to construct a 95% confidence uh, that people believe that the economy is getting better. And we don't have any survey. We don't have anything. What do we do? Well, we will assume that 50, 50, 50% 50 agree that we're getting better. 50% does not agree. Or in short, this is all we're doing is everything is the same. The only thing different is we're using this fixed number because we don't have a point estimator of 0.34, we will use the 0.5 and 0.5. 0.5 times 0.5 will give you 0.225. Or in short, that fixed number. If we don't know the P hat, we will use this fixed 0.25. Uh, and again, everything is the same. Everything is the same. 1.96 divided by 0.02 or 0.03. And again, the only thing different now, as you can see, because we don't have a, a point estimator, this is how many people we need. 
And I know some of you guys say, Mr. Tran, this is point one. Why don't we go down? Remember, doesn't matter as long as there's a decimal. We will always go up to the next whole number. We don't have that rule that five or more. We go up and less than five, we, we drop it, right? We don't have that standard route up rule. This thing here, because it's the end, we go up to the next whole number, okay? So first of all, question with this problem here, ladies and gentlemen, question of, of how to utilize this, this, this uh, formula. And again, it's a lot of number crunching, right? It's a lot of number crunching here. Um, well, let's take a look at, if you don't have question, let's take a look at 7.4. And we would go back, uh, 7.4 is, is nothing new. It's not, it's nothing new in the way that this is all there is in 7.4, ladies and gentlemen, is they merge everything together. They, they merge everything together and, and they ask you to determine which method do you use or how do you distinguish the difference between the problem, okay? So if you take a look at this thing here, let's say that in, 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 if in the ideal environment, let's say that if I were to see you in the classroom and I will give you the test and let's say that this three problem is on the same page on your test how would you determine which item to use? Because remember what option we have. We have a Z distribution, a Z critical value, and we use the Z interval feature in our calculator. We have a T distribution and a T interval, and then we have the one proportional Z, right? Those are your three options, right? And again, I, I purposely give you this three item and this is your challenge. This is your goal, right? If you glance through, if you don't read anything and you glance through the problem, this is they ask you to do is construct a confident interval, construct a confident interval, construct a confident interval. So we know the three problem, they ask us to construct the confident interval. So construct the confident interval for a proportion. So if you see that a proportion, you say, ah, proportion, there's only one option. I will use the one proportional Z interval. Right, And then you run down here, they say, construct a confident interval for a population mean, construct a confident interval for a population mean. Ah, two and three, this is where your problem arise, right? Hopefully you guys see that one is easy. One is easy, why? Because we deal with a proportion and there's only one proportion item we have, which is we need an N, we need an X, we need a confident level. So if you look at N, let's uh, look at one, let's do one first and then we dissect number two later and, and spot the difference, I should say, right? So if you look at one, very easy, we know that this thing here, they ask us for a proportion. And if they ask us for a proportion, we will use the one proportional Z interval. And if we use in the one proportional Z interval, what do we need? Well, we need an N, which is the total. We need the X, which is the people who will vote in this case. And we need this confident level. So everybody see the end. Uh, and if you go in again, the, the information behind is we have 400 voter and 220 of them plan to vote for the next mayor, right? And they ask us, we need to construct this confident interval that who will vote? What is the percentage of the people voting for the next mayor? So looking at this thing here, again, we did this earlier. All we need to do is using his stat, go to test one proportional Z, type in your X, type in your N, type in your level. This is the percentage, right? 48.6% to 61.4% of the people will vote for the next mayor, right? So again, proportional is this in 7.3, we did this item here. Um, Anybody does not get this number, this interval, or anybody need to see how to utilize your calculator for the one proportional Z. So if you don't have that, let's take a look at two and three. And this is the most challenging part of chapter seven and chapter eight for you guys, ladies and gentlemen. This is the most challenging part is how do you spot the difference? 
right? Because they ask you to construct the confidence interval for the population mean. So if you look at number two, they say that the sample of the sample size of 18 have the mean 71.32 and the standard deviation of S. So first of all, hopefully you guys spot the difference here. This thing here, they give you the S versus down here. Well, down here, they spell it out to you guys and they give you guys the symbolic. So again, this is the main difference that I mentioned to you guys. The main difference that I mentioned to you guys is if they spell it out for you guys, if they say the population standard deviation or if they give you the sigma, if they give you the sigma, then that is related to your population standard deviation. And if they give you the population standard deviation, ladies and gentlemen, we will use the Z critical value or Z distribution or the Z confident interval. In this case, they give us the S and hopefully you guys remember the S is the sample standard deviation. And if we deal with the sample standard deviation, as you can see, this is what you ask yourself. This is your thought of process. You want to train your thought process like this. What all they ask us to do, they ask us to construct the population mean. And do they give us, what do they give us in terms of the standard deviation? They give us the sample standard deviation. And because they give us the sample standard deviation, we will use the T distribution. The reason I wrote the T distribution is if for some problem, they ask you for a T critical value, you have to use their T distribution table, which you need the degree of freedom and then you need the percentage, okay? So now once you identify that we need, you, we use in the T, this is what we have is we have the N, we have the X bar, we have the S and we have the level, right? Those are the four items we need those are the four items that we will use or we have to use to find this critical value. So hopefully, you know, in this item, and again, this is all there is in chapter 7.4 is they merge everything together and they ask you to spot the difference. So this thing here, the main difference is they give us the sample, they give us the sample standard deviation. And again, to go and review or to remind you guys to, find this item to find number two, we hit stat, we scroll over to test, and then we scroll down to the T interval. Because it's a T distribution, we use it, the T interval, which is your option number eight. And again, make sure that you using your stat, you use your stat and you your stat item is up here or blinking. And we type in now X, for this problem, 71.32, we type in our S in this item, 15.78. We type in our N, 18 of them. We type in our interval level, which 95%, and then we calculate. So as you can see, those are the four items that they give us relate to the population mean that we need to construct the confidence interval. If they ask us for a proportion, they only give us the X and the N. So once we have this thing here, if you calculate this item, your interval will be between 63.473 and 79.167. Or if you route up to two decimal place, this is what we have is 63.47 and 79.17. And like I mentioned, if they don't spell it out, if they don't say population standard deviation, and if they don't give you the sigma, if they don't do that, then you will use all 95% of the time, this will be a sample standard deviation. So again, number three, they ask us to find the confident interval for the population mean. And if they ask us for a population mean, we ask ourselves, do they give us the population standard deviation? In this case, they do give us a population standard deviation. So we will use a Z distribution or the Z critical value. And again, the Z critical value, this is what we have, or this is what we need. We need an N, we need an X bar, we need a Sigma, and again, the only thing different here is instead of using the T interval in your calculator, option number eight in your calculator or feature, 
we use in the Z interval, which is option number seven, which is your feature for the Z interval. And if you type this thing in, if you type in correct number, your confident interval should be 2.45 and 4.26. Okay, so this is what we need. This is what you have to do uh, in terms of the item or in terms of the material that you have. And the biggest, the biggest challenge, and, and hopefully you guys see that it's not really a challenge. The biggest thing that you will see that you need to do is you need to determine if it's a population standard deviation or is this the sample standard deviation. Question with number one, two, or three here, ladies and gentlemen. Now, let's try another one, right? Let's try another one and let's say, same idea go. Let's say that this three item is in your, in your test, on your test, on your paper. Again, the, the thing on the, on the, the thing with your setting is, um, each problem is on a separate screen. Um, you cannot answer number four, five, uh, unless you answer number four, right? And, and it's not, you know, they won't throw at the same screen like I do right here. Uh, but, you know, I throw it so that you guys can see or, or can spot the difference. Um, so first of all, hopefully you guys see that number, number four is easy because they ask us for a proportion. Uh, right, they ask us for a proportion that's easy, that's 7.3, that will be 1Z proportional, um, 1Z proportional, uh, one proportional Z feature. Um, number five, and number six, uh, let's take a look at number five uh, and, and number six, right? In a sample of 87 adults, the average time per day in bed asleep were 7.06 hour. Assume the population standard deviation. Ah, what is that? Assume the population standard deviation. As you can see, they give us the population standard deviation. They spell it out for us. They spell it out that we have the population standard deviation. And that is the trick, or that is the trigger word, right? Population standard deviation, we're using the Z critical value. We're using the Z interval. If you look at number six, they say 50 measurements are taken of the octane rate for a particular type of gasoline. The sample mean rate in percent were 85.8% with the standard deviation of this. So you say, wait a minute, Mr. Tran, this thing here, how do we know if this is a sample standard deviation? And if you remember, I told you guys that if they don't spell it out for you, if they don't say population standard deviation, or if they don't give you the symbolic of the sigma, if they don't give you the sigma symbolic, then 99% of the time this item here is the sample standard deviation, okay? If they don't spell it out, if they don't give you the symbolic, this is the sample standard deviation. Or in the contact, in this contact, they give you the sample mean, they give you this sample and they say, with this sample, you come with this standard deviation, meaning this standard deviation is based on this sample here, okay? So with the standard deviation, meaning the contact of this standard deviation is based on the sample that we have, is not based on the population. If it's based on the population, they will spell it out for you guys, okay? So that's your challenge, ladies and gentlemen. That's your obstacle is, how do you, if you look at this thing here and on, on, on high side, right? If you look at this thing here, how can you determine which one is the population standard deviation and which one is the sample standard deviation? And if you can do that, if you can do that, uh, everything else should be very doable. So let's go back to number four, right? Number four, we know that they ask us for a proportion. They ask us to construct a proportion uh, interval for a proportion. And to construct a proportion, we know that we will need an N, we know that we need an X, and we know that we need the confident level, which is the C level in this case, 0.95. And we will use this option for a proportion. Again, for proportion, it's easy. You have only one option. You have only one feature, which is the one proportion Z interval. 
And if you type in your calculator, if you type your one proportion Z interval, they will ask you for your X, they will ask you for your N, they will ask you for the C level. And this is what we have, right? Uh, again, hopefully you guys don't have a, a, well, first of all, question, anybody, question of, of how to type in your calculator or, or where to locate your future. Um, my assumption is you all know, that's why I type it this way. Um, but if you want to see it, we, we can type it in and, and see. And number five, right? Number five and number six, those are your challenge, which we identify that they ask us to construct a interval for the mean. And again, they give us, they give us the population standard deviation. And because they give us the population standard deviation, we will use the, the Z distribution, uh, which is the Z critical value, which is the Z interval feature in your calculator. And again, the fourth thing that we need is the N, the total sample size. We need the X ball, we need a Sigma, and we need the C level, which is confident level. And again, this is the feature in your calculator that we will be using, which is the option number seven, the Z interval. And once you type that in, we can see that the percentage or, or the, the, the hour of sleep for all adult, right? Based on this 81 sample that I have, we will guesstimate that every single adult in America will sleep between 6.75 to 7.37 hour a day, okay? That's what the goal is, right? That's, that's the goal is we, we guesstimate the population mean, and based on this information, the adult population of the adult will spend on bed, in bed is uh, 6.75 and 7.37. Uh, 7 7 we don't know exactly which one, but we know it's between those idea or, or those hours. And again, looking at number six, the octane problem, we know that they give us the mean and with the standard deviation, or in this case, the sample standard deviation, we know that we're using the T distribution. And again, the four item that we need is the X, the X bar, the N, the S, and the C level. And then we know that we're using this feature, the T interval. And then this is what we have, which is 80, 5.5% to 86.1%, okay? So the percentage of octane in your gasoline is between those percentage. Question here, ladies and gentlemen, question on how to determine which feature to use. Is it the Z interval versus the T interval? All right, if you don't have question, let's, uh, let's skip one for now that I will go back uh, a bit. Let's take a look at this item here first. Um, I, I think some of the question home, some of the homework question they ask you instead of do the calculation, they want to ask you what is the relationship between the two items. Uh, I mentioned this a, a, a few times back in terms that the confident interval with your critical value, uh, right. If you increase your confident interval, you have to increase your critical value or in that nature. Uh, and now some of your item, they will ask you something in terms of what is the relationship between your confident interval and your margin of error? Well, your margin of error and your confident interval, they have this direct relationship. What does it mean direct rela relationship? Meaning if we increase the level of confidence, meaning from, from, nine point, from 95% to 98%, if you increase your C level, your level of confidence, then your critical value will increase. And if your critical value increase, meaning when you multiply to a bigger number, your margin of error will eventually increase. Okay, so that's what we have is your level of confidence, your confidence level will increase when your margin of error increase. So if your margin of error increase, your level of confidence increase, they will have those direct relationship. One increase, the other one increase, one decrease, the other one will decrease, okay? And if they change in the item and they ask you, what about the relationship between a margin of error and the sample size, the N, right? 
So they have this indirect relationship. What does it mean, indirect relationship? Meaning one will get larger while the other one will get smaller. So if one go large, the other one goes smaller. So in terms of this thing here, the margin of error, if, if you, you get the smaller margin of error, your sample size has to be larger. Meaning if you remember, I keep on saying, if we collect a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of data, well, if we have a lot of data, our margin of error will get smaller, okay? So vice versa, if you have a small sample size, the margin of error will be bigger, okay? So that's the indirect relationship in terms of, term of those. So uh, again, I, I think some of the question they ask you, if, if our margin of error is increased, what would be your level of confidence, your confidence level? So if your margin of error increased, your confidence is increased. If your margin of error is increased, what is the sample size? Well, if your margin of error increased, your sample size will be decreased, okay? So uh, they have those items there, okay? Uh, like, I think like on your homework, they, they, they give you like that drag down box, you have to drag down. So uh, I just wanna mention this so that you, you won't get confused if they ask you those questions. Uh, question with this, this relationship between the item here. Well, let's take a look at this thing here. And if you did, if you did chapter, uh, 7.2, you probably run into this particular problem. Uh, this particular problem, instead of give you like what I, instead of give you like this, where they give you the sample mean and they give you the sample standard deviation or a sample mean and the population standard deviation, they give you this problem where it's a raw data, right? So they say that the cost of repair is the name of the problem. The sample of eight repair recorded as a certain fiber optic component, component would draw, and the cost of the repair in dollar were recorded with the following results. So again, someone come in and repair, they cost $30, $35, $8, $19, and so on and so forth. They ask you to construct this back plot for this data. And does the assumption, do the assumption will uh, met for us to construct the confident interval? Right. So looking at this item here to construct the dot plot is very easy. Your dot plot for me, I just list my, my data from 15 to 35. And basically you go into the data and you put a dot, right? Dot plot is you put a dot on your data. If you have multiple data, you just stack your dot, right? So in this case, I have one data, $30, one data, $35, $19 somewhere here. $23 somewhere here, uh, $27, $22, $26, and $16. So basically I just go into each of my data. And again, I can list, I can list 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, so on and so forth. But I I just you know we don't need to be exact, we just need to have a, a estimate, right? So how do we know given our raw data? How do we know if it's fit the description or it's met the criteria? Well, remember there are three items that we need, right? The three items that we need is, is do we, can we detect an outlier? Is there an outlier somewhere in my data? And looking at this thing here, it, all of this thing here is very close. You say, oh, the 35 is over here, but compared to the data, 35 and 30, they are very close in terms of the units, right? And, if this thing were to be in like 75, somewhere right here, then we say, okay, that might be an outlier, right? Someone over like pride routing, right? Someone over charge, right? Uh, if we have some dot like 95, we're like, wait a minute, everything is in this range, why there's a 95? So there's no outlier, there's no clear outlier. So we say that's, that's checked, right? And then, this thing here is kind of scattered. It's not really skewed. It's not like all of the data on one group, like very close. It's kind of very scattered out. So we say that this kind of balance out too. And we don't have any particular multiple mode, right? We don't have like, we don't clearly see there are more than one mode, right? So look at this item here is fit the criteria. If we have an outlier, we cannot do it. 
if we have like a bunch of data, like all of them mush to one group and then scatter, scatter out like a bunch of data over here and scatter balance out one, one, one here, then we cannot do it. But most of this thing here, they well, is scatter, no outlier, we're good to go. So we haven't done this problem in terms of how to use your, utilize your calculator. All right, so how would we do this thing here with our calculator? So one thing we can do, one thing we can do is you can find your sample mean, you can find your sample standard deviation and reminder, how do you find your sample mean and find your sample standard deviation? Well, we hit stat, go back to chapter three, we use in the edit mode, which is we edit this item. And then in L1, we type in our data, which is 30, 35, I typed this thing before already. So 30, 35, type in all of your data in. We have eight data, those are my eight, eight data. And then you hit stat and then you do the calculation. So if you want to, you can do the one volt stat and remember in chapter three, the one volt stat give us a few things. They give us the X ball. They give us the X ball, which is 24, 75. And they give us the S, we using the S. Why are we using the S, ladies and gentlemen, and not the P? Because we are dealing with a sample. They give us the raw data, which is our raw data. We deal with the sample item. So the sample item we do with the S, okay? So if you want to, you can take this 24.75 and then the, the S, which is 6.08861. 631098, and you can plug into your either the Z distribution or the T distribution, okay? But let me ask you guys, which one am I using? Am I using the Z or am I using the T? Again, that's the, the challenge, right? Am I using the T feature or am I using the, the Z feature? So reminder, the difference between the two is the Z, they give us the population standard deviation. In this case, we don't have the population standard deviation. We only have the raw data. And if we have a raw data, we will use the, the T interval, okay? The T interval is your raw data. So if you want to, if you plug it in, you can plug in, like I mentioned, the X24.75 or that. If not, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't find the standard deviation and you don't find your don't find your your mean, this is what you can do is remember I told you last time, make sure that the stat is blinking. But if you have a raw data like this problem, what you can do is you can tell your calculator, hey calculator, I have a data for you. So in order to tell your calculator to use the data, you need to make sure that your data item is blinking and select your data. And then again, you tell your data L1 is the data, go into L1 and look for that data and use that data to calculate for me. I don't have a mean, I don't have a standard deviation. I have this raw data, go into that L1. My L1, I have 30, 35, 8, 19 and so on. And then again, your frequency, just leave it one. Don't change anything about frequency. And your C level will be 98% because they asked us to do the 98%. So again, once you have that, all you need to do is plug it in. And this is what they should give you, which is your confident interval. And again, 18.2, uh, 18.3, 31.2. And again, the two things they give us is the sample mean and the sample standard deviation here, those are the two that we have, right? So if you look at this item here, if they give you the raw item, if they give you the raw item, then the raw item will always be the sample standard deviation. And if it's a sample standard deviation, this is what we have uh, in terms that we use in the T distribution because it's a sample standard deviation. And if you use the T distribution, I mentioned right here that instead, in order for you to use the T distribution, you need to have the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. But because it's a raw data, we don't have that. So instead of using the stat feature, we're using the data feature in your calculator. And that's why I showed you earlier that we're using the data and your data is in your L1, okay? 
So given this thing here, given this thing here, once you type it in, we saw the interval is 18.296 or something in that nature, which is 18.3 and 31.2. Uh, so again, we will say that the mean average price or the mean cost for the replacement is $18.30 to $31.20, okay? And, and someone say, oh, I go to this thing here and I pay $35. You say, oh, you, got, oh, you are overcharged, right? Because the average is between $18 and $31 and someone paid $35, you are being overcharged, okay? So looking at this thing here, question, if we were to have a raw data, uh, we did not, I did not show you or did this problem in, in 7.1 or 7.2, 7.2 is your, your sample. So I show it right here so that you guys can see that if you encounter this problem, you guys can do it. Question here, ladies and gentlemen. Well, if you don't have question, that is the end of chapter seven. Uh, 7.4, like I mentioned, is nothing new. It's just much everything together. And as you, can you determine, can you decipher your information uh, to determine if it a if it's a um, uh, a z interval or is it a t interval or is it a one proportional z interval? Okay. So if you don't have that question in chapter seven, let's take a look at chapter eight. Um, I I want to mention chapter eight. So the next time I see you, uh, the next time we we see each other, the second time you you hear this definition it will be a little bit easier, hopefully, right? So if you get a little bit confused about the definition that we have uh, in, in the beginning, don't worry, we will go over again. So in chapter eight, we will do the hypothesis testing. 8.1 is just the theorem or, or the basic idea behind this hypothesis testing, okay? So in this item here, if, if you look at this, this story, if you look at this information, they say that the study published in the Journal of Air and Waste Management Association report that the mean amount of particulate matter, PM, produced by a car and light truck in an open setting is 35 milligram of PM per mile of travel. Suppose that a new engine design is proposed that is intent to reduce the amount of PM in this air. So again, you know, people, you know, they say, oh, this thing released too many pollution. Let me invent this engine to reduce this pollution, right? So if you do this, if you produce this engine, if you make this engine, there are two items can happen, right? You can be successfully produce this engine and this engine reduce the pollution that release, or you might fail and it does not reduce, right? So with that, with that, this is what we, we do is we have this hypothesis testing. And in this hypothesis testing, whatever the claim we make, we want to test that claim, okay? So in this item for us, for our hypothesis testing, we will identify two hypotheses. And just like the science item, hypothesis is your, your, you know, your theorem, your, your theory, your idea, what you assume that might happen, right? But for us, we will have two hypotheses. We will call the first hypothesis the null hypothesis. And the second hypothesis, we will say that is a alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is this item right here, ladies and gentlemen, and you will hear me say a lot that a null hypothesis is a dummy variable. So why is a dummy variable? Because the null hypothesis can only take on one symbolic, one item, which the null hypothesis can only be equal to some value, okay? So the null hypothesis, we will say H sub zero or H sub O, so this is your notation. So whenever you see H sub zero or H sub O, we say that is a null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis will end, will, can only, we can only take on an equal symbolic, an equal sign. 
it cannot take on any other side other than the equal sign. And that's why I call it a dummy variable because it's only equal to something. It cannot be anything other than the equal sign, okay? So if the null hypothesis is can only be equal to something like this, the null hypothesis, the mean is equal to 35 because they, they based on this 35 milligram, the null hypothesis, which is the pollution release, which is again, the null is equal to 35, okay? So if the null hypothesis can only be equal to something, the alternative hypothesis for our author, for our book, the alternative hypothesis is H sub one. So again, the null hypothesis is H sub zero and the alternative hypothesis is H sub one. Sometime you will see that H sub A, which is the null hypothesis is H sub zero, H sub O and the alternative is H sub A. So some author use H sub A for alternative. For us, the H sub one is the alternative, okay? So the alternative a little bit better than the null hypothesis. They can take on a less than sign. They can take on a less than symbol, which is the less than inequality. Or they can take on the righter than sign, which is, is greater than symbolic. Or they can take on a not equal to, which is again, different. So this is the three item that the alternative hypothesis can take on. They can take on less than side, they can take on the right hand side, they can take on not equal to. So as long as it's one of these three items, it will be in your alternative hypothesis, okay? The null hypothesis can only be equal to some value, but the alternative hypothesis can be less than something, can be greater than something or can be not equal to something, okay? And if you see that the inequality point to the left, if it's point to the left, we say that this is the left tail test. If it's point to the right, it's a right tail test. And if it does not have any point, if it's not equal to, we'll say that it's a two tail test, okay? So again, we will see more detail of this. For now, just know that it's a one tail test if it's a less than or greater than. And if it's a less than, it's a left tail. If it's greater than, it's a right tail. And again, if it's two tail, if it's not equal to. Okay. And again, like I say, hopefully when we put all this thing together in, in chapter 8.2, when we put all this thing together, it will be a little bit easier. For now, you say, oh, alternative hypothesis, uh, uh, alternative and, and null hypothesis, what is all this about? For now, they just want to give you an idea that if we were to give you this item, if we were to give you this item, can you identify what kind of hypothesis that you have? Can you identify if you were to go in and do all this testing, what kind of testing should we do? Well, not yet. What kind of hypothesis should we state? Okay, so let's take a look number one. This thing here, all they ask you to do is just state the hypothesis. State what you want to test, okay? So state the null hypothesis and state the alternative hypothesis. That's what they ask you. So last year, the mean amount spent by a customer at a certain, certain restaurant were $35. The restaurant owner believed that the mean might be higher this year. So what is his belief? He believed that the mean should be or must maybe, maybe higher, right? So do you agree that the null hypothesis is, is equal to $35? Now, do you agree that this is what he believed? He believed that the mean is greater than maybe, right? We don't know, we don't know yet. We haven't done the test, so we don't know what to do. But for now, do you agree that he believed that the mean, which is the mu, might be greater than, might be bigger than, maybe higher than $35. So if because it's higher than or greater than or more than, it will be the, inequality of greater than here, right? The mean is greater than 35. And if it's greater than, it's in the alternative hypothesis. And if this is in the alternative hypothesis, 
What is your null hypothesis? What is your dummy variable? Well, your dummy variable will be, the null hypothesis will be equal to. And again, that's why I call this a dummy variable because you will never have anything other than the equal sign. For your null hypothesis for this author, for this item here, the null hypothesis, the H sub zero, will always be equal to some whatever the value you have. Whatever the value they give you, whatever the mean value they give you, that will be equal to that. And the alternative is based on what they say. Do they say it's less than? Do they say it's greater than? Or do they say not equal to? Okay. So let's take a look at number two. Number two, again, they say that the mean weight of the newborn boy in a certain country was 6.6 .6 pounds. The doctor wants to know whether the mean weight of the newborn girl is different from this. So again, you say, wait a minute, the idea, the information here is the boy and the information here that she wants to know is a girl. But you no, know, for now, we don't care about in that detail yet. We want to know what is it mean by different? Do you agree that different is not less than? It can be less than, but it also can be greater than. Right, because he wants to know the difference. Do you agree a difference is as long as it's not equal to six point six, then that's different from six point six. And if it's not equal to, if it's different, then this is your alternative hypothesis. Your alternative hypothesis can be less than, can be greater than, can be different. And if this is the alternative hypothesis, well, the null hypothesis can only be equal to. And again, the null hypothesis, once you identify the number, the null hypothesis will be that equal to that number, okay? So question here, question with, with, with you know, for now, for now, just know that there are two hypotheses. The null hypothesis, which is the dummy variable is take on equal sign only. And the alternative hypothesis can be greater than depend on your information they give you. Right, the information they give you right here is higher than, which is greater than, which is your greater than sign. The information they give right here is different. Different meaning is not the same, not the same meaning not equal to. So we say not equal to. And again, if you look at this thing here, you will see that again, whatever the information they give you, they say that the aut automobile engineer think that the mean for the car with a larger engine will be less than this less than this. What is this? This is the 25.5, right? This is the marge per gallon of gasoline that the, the, the truck or the car consume. So if you look at this thing here, what is mean less than? Do you agree that less than is the mu is less than this? What is this? 25.5. That is the amount of gas uh, of gallon in your car. Right, and again, uh, miles per gallon in your car. That, and because it's less than, it will be in your alternative hypothesis. And again, if uh, it's your alternative hypothesis, your null hypothesis will be equal to. So again, your, you know, for me, for me, and, and for this author and for this this book, most of the claim is in the hy alternative hypothesis, and, and that's why I. This one here, you know, when I do it, I identify the, the null hypothesis first, but when I show you guys, I, I identify the alternative because most of the information they give you in the problem, uh, most of the claim, most of the claim that, that they want to claim is in the alternative hypothesis, okay? Um, so let me ask you guys a question here in terms of how to identify the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis. Now, let's do one more item. And then um, this thing here is a little bit, um, a little bit challenged, um, a little bit, well, not. Let me uh, show you the purpose or the idea of this hypothesis testing. So the idea of this hypothesis testing for us is similar to this trial that you go to court. Well, not you, but someone go to court, 
right? So if you go to this criminal court, remember they always say that innocent until proven guilty, right? We we go in there, we assume that that person is innocent. And then again, what you do is you go in and you give them all this evidence and you say, based on all this evidence, is contradict the innocence of that person. So it's innocent until proven guilty. So if we can prove that that person is guilty, then that person will no longer be innocent, right? So that's what the hypothesis testing for us is, is the same as that. This is what we have is we assume that the null hypothesis, and you say, wait a minute, what does that mean the null hypothesis is true? Well, our assumption is the null hypothesis is true. We have this, we assume that the null hypothesis is true. And then once we have the null hypothesis true, we go in and we're looking for evidence. We're looking for data, we collect the data, we do all this testing, and then we look at this evidence and this is what we have. This is your decision-making, ladies and gentlemen. You have only two decision-making is if you find if you find evidence to reject the null hypothesis, remember, we assume that it's true. We go in and we find something and we say, oh, wait a minute. This contradicts the truth of the null hypothesis. So if this contradicts the truth of the null hypothesis, meaning we reject the null hypothesis. And if we reject the null hypothesis, and like I mentioned earlier, most of the time your claim is in the alternative. And if you reject the null hypothesis, meaning you accept the alternative hypothesis, okay? And now this is the only two options you have. This is the only two options you have in this item here, ladies and gentlemen, is you will either reject the null hypothesis or you fail to reject or do not reject the null hypothesis. You will never ever say we accept something, okay? So for us, this is what we have. This is your conclusion. This is what we will say. And we will do more of this thing here later when we put all this thing up. But again, this is what you have is you either reject the null hypothesis. And if you reject the null hypothesis, you will say that we the alternate hypothesis will be what we have and the alternate will be uh, we will accept, the, not accept, but the, the alternative hypothesis will be true, okay? And basically, when you recheck the null hypothesis, later on you will say that if you recheck the null hypothesis, you will just say, we have enough evidence to state whatever you try to state, okay? And if you fail to reject, if you do not reject the null hypothesis, we do not say that, oh, we accept it. We just say we do not, we, we, we fail to reject it, meaning we just don't have enough evidence for now, okay? So we're not saying that the alternative is true. We're not saying that the null hypothesis is true. We just say that for now, we don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis, okay? So again, that's the idea is, is, is we go in, we have these two hypotheses. We have the null hypothesis and we assume that the null hypothesis is true. We go in there and we try to disprove it. If we can disprove the null hypothesis, then we reject it. And if we reject it, we say that the alternative hypothesis is what we have, what we will accept, what we don't accept it. We just say that we have confidence that this will be what we have, okay? And if we fail to reject, if we do not reject it, we just say, we don't have enough evidence yet. We not say that you are true. We not say that I'm wrong, you're right. I'm just saying that right now, we don't have enough evidence, okay? So that's the idea of, of this um, hypothesis testing. Um, let's stop here for today. Uh, I, I know some of you guys probably are a little bit per 